I hereby introduce to you, Mr. Michael Veazey. Welcome to Amazing FBA. Today's show is brought to you by Escape the Rat Race, run by Christian Rodwell. Escape the Rat Race is there to do one job, help people escape the day job and create financial freedom for themselves. I'm going to be collaborating with Christian to run uh, physical training in London, England on the 21st of April. So that's what I'm talking about now. If you can't make it to those things, the location or date, just spool forward and listen to the rest of the show. If you think you might be able to make that, listen up because we are doing in-person training in a very small group, maximum six people. We've already sold four places. And the purpose is that is very, very simple to make sure you get over the biggest roadblock, which is getting something selling online uh, on Amazon, I should say, and then basically deciding which product you're going to be able to private label. That's the purpose of the day. Very, very powerful, very simple. You're going to be focused because it's in person. You're not going to be distracted in the online environment or, or your office or whatever other place you might work on a business. Plus, you'll be free to discuss things absolutely openly because we'll all sign a non-disclosure agreement and it's a small group, not a massive Facebook group. Um, you're going to get also an amazing deal this time around and this time around only, which is ongoing support in the form of three months of free membership of the Zero to Hero Mastermind, which meets month, once a month, mostly Saturdays as well, in London. So you need to be able to get to London, of course, to make this work for you. Plus, 90 minutes of online mentoring or in-person mentoring with me personally. So you don't need to get it to, to London for that. So it's a very powerful package. I believe that this is going to be the most powerful way to move you forward out there simply because offline is way more focused than online and the hand-holding and the ongoing implementation support is really what makes the difference. So if you want to check that out, go to amazingfba.com forward slash workshop. If the thing is already sold out, don't panic because we will have an email sign up there and we'll keep you posted. If you are interested in future training, we're definitely going to be running it again because there is a need out there. Thanks so much for listening. Now on with the show. Hi, and welcome back to Amazing FBA. This is your host, Michael Vizi, and today I'm going to be talking about the reality of private label life. Last time I talked about the sort of ups and downs, the emotional journey. Today I'm going to talk about how to sell on Amazon, some more practical tips. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the skills, really. Well, the only thing I'm going to really focus on today is the skills you're going to need to learn. So there are three basic areas that we talk about at Amazing FBA, niche, source, and launch. Or another way of putting it is find out what people want, go get it and give it to them, right? The first and most important thing is to find out what people want. That's what I call the niche part or market research, otherwise known as product research. The first thing you've got to do with product research is come up with some ideas. Now, a lot of people try and use uh, a laptop computer and online tools. I think you need to be using the old necktop computer. Why? Because basically, you are going to find a lot more imaginative ideas there that aren't yet saturated because everyone else can use numerical-based tools. It doesn't take imagination. And there are tens of thousands of people using tools like Jungle Scout's web app. It is a useful tool. If you run it through some filters, I'm, so, I'm not saying don't use this. It's just not my preferred method. So I think you have to split things into two parts, really. One is product idea creation, which is what I call pick, and then the product idea filtering, which I call PIF. The product idea creation, you start with one idea and you go to hundreds or hundreds potentially, and then the product idea filtering, you start with 100 ideas and you filter it down to three, four, or five maximum that will potentially work, and then we move on to the sourcing phase and find out whether the numbers work and whether you can get the quality of product that you want and the differentiated product for the right kind of price. So let's start off with some details. So the product idea creation, here are some ideas of how you can find some, I, some product ideas. Uh, number one is hobbies. The weirder, the better. Rock climbing is better than football, for example, because everyone does football or they seem to. Number two, home life. Um, anything you touch in the kitchen really is potentially something. It's a huge category, home and kitchen. There's uh, bedroom stuff, you know, and bathroom. Again, the weirder, the better, the more niche, the more unusual, the better. If you're just going to do standardized things, you're going to get a bit of a standard result, which is you're competing with everyone else. Uh, if you really have no imagination, you just can do a touch list for the day. It's literally everything you touch. Like right now, I'm holding a microphone. There's probably a microphone stand involved. In front of me, there's a video camera. There's a video camera tripod. I wouldn't necessarily go for complex electronics if you're ordering from China, folks. I've done that. It is a bit stressful because the defect rates are higher, but there's nothing wrong with going with things related. For example, don't sell phones. You could sell a phone 
holder, whatever that is. Now, a lot of these ideas will not be great because they're fairly generic, but just don't filter at this stage. Your idea, product idea creation is a creative and messy approach. And you've got to go from nothing to lots and lots of ideas, filter them later. If in doubt, don't pre-filter things. Just it's just like the advice people give to writers that just write, you're not even allowed to use the backspace key and then edit. It's exactly the same here. We're coming up with ideas, edit later. By the way, I'm going to be going into this in huge detail in the workshop that's coming up on the 21st of April in London town. There's still a couple of spaces left. If that interests you, keep listening. I'll tell you more towards the end of this video. Number four, specialist magazines. This is really good. Again, it can come back to unusual hobbies or sports. Like if you're into rock climbing, uh, there's almost certainly going to see some product advertising in a place like there that is quite unusual and that is not just a, a standard thing. And it may or may not be on Amazon, which is another question. But if there's something like it on Amazon, that can be a really powerful start. Uh, the example of that is the Gree Gree, which is a thing that climbers use. I still don't know what it is, but Will Chernan was using that as an example. So Will Chernan got into rock climbing a while ago. And uh, he was saying that, you know, suddenly he saw this strange equipment that within that world, within the niche of rock climbers was very, very well known. And outside of that, no one knew what it was, which is great. What you don't want to pick is something that has like a 10 word keyword to explain it. For example, noise cancelling Bluetooth headphones is the example that Will's always given, which is just ridiculous. I mean, the, the number of people looking for a keyword that long is going to be, you know, 20 a month. Uh, so there's not a market there. Whereas a Gree Gree unknown outside of the uh, little niche that it serves and very well known within it. That's a perfect kind of private label area to explore. The other things connected with that, especially shops, again, sports springs to mind, but it could be um, music, it could be, you know, dance or something. I mean, dance doesn't sound like something that has a lot of physical things associated with it, but what do I know? I'm not a dancer. Whatever you know that other people don't, is a potential business advantage. This is why I ultimately think you should start with what you know, and at the very, very least, use some imagination. Um, you don't have to be wedded to what you know, but you should start there. I mean, if just using computers all the time means that you don't have an imagination, we will use tools to filter stuff, but the creation of ideas, I think, is best done by yourself. Number six, trendy shops. Uh, I think that can be interesting. They can be on trend, for example, in London, sort of hipster tea shops could be an interesting thing to explore. For example, that's just what springs to mind. Last and not least, you can be online, but use your imagination. Don't go to Amazon to get product ideas. Go to some social media tribes or generally just tribes online there. Facebook groups, blogs, uh, YouTube channels, RSS feeds. Instagram is great for this. Pinterest is great for this. Generally find a sort of obsessive group that is really, really into somewhat strange or niche activity. When I say strange, I don't mean strange for the sake of it. I mean, people who spend money on some kind of products that aren't well known. These are all great places, folks, to, to come up with some product ideas. Now then, the next thing we've got to do is translate these ideas into keywords. What I suggest is you keep it very simple. If you get too much data, then you are going to blow up and mentally your laptop computer and your next top computer won't speak to each other. Your laptop can cope easily with data. That's all computers are like data crunching machines, right? They're getting more sophisticated, but basically that's what they're good at. Now, our brains aren't necessarily good at that. They work in terms of stories and people. So what we need to think about is a person who's interested in this stuff and make sure that we relate back any any keywords to people and the sorts of things they're looking for. For example, if somebody has a fishing rod and they find that it tends to fall over too easily, some kind of really stable stand to keep a fishing rod up might be what they're looking for. And they're looking for, if you like, a, a rod stabilizer or something like that. So if you're not what, sure what words people use to express it, just have a bit of a brainstorm to start with. So this is slightly different from brainstorming ideas, this is more specifically about the keywords related to one idea, right? So rod stabilizer, stabilizer for fishing rod, angling rod stabilizer. This is all made up off of the top of my head. I'm not really an angler, so I don't know, but this is an idea of something a bit obscure. Then we need to translate that into a few keywords, right? That we're going to put into Amazon and let Amazon do the heavy work. Amazon autocomplete or Amazon auto suggest will come up with a bunch of keywords for products that they know based on their stats their statistics, their analysis will sell. So I would just start with that. I wouldn't use merchant words. I used to. It will come up with a million product ideas or, or keywords, but you'll drown in data. 
Honestly, I think the imagination, the laptop, laptop computer is where you need to cre create ideas. When it comes to keywords, keep it simple because you'll have plenty of work to do to filter those down to the winning or the probably winning the high probability markets. So let's talk about the filtering for multiple keywords in the same niche. So you never just depend on one keyword to tell you the whole answer. For example, for fishing rod stabilizers, even if it exists and if it doesn't, it probably should, in which case that might be an opportunity. I came up with a few different keywords. So fishing rod stabilizer, stabilizer for angling, angling rod stabilizer, whatever it is. And let your, you know, first of all, come up with some ideas and of keywords. And secondly, let Amazon Autocomplete tell you if, if people are actually searching for this stuff. Then you want to just measure, and I'm going to look at this quickly and simply now, but there are many nuances to this. The demand, if nobody's making any money on that, it could be that you're ahead of the curve. And if there's lots of activity off Amazon, but not yet on Amazon, and you are one of the first to bring things to market there, you can make a lot of money. And that can be a very smart strategy. It's called the Blue Ocean Strategy after the book of the same name. That said, if you are a new seller, and I know the majority of people listening here are, that doesn't strike me as a very safe bet. I think you're better off going for a safe bet, but potentially lower rewards as well to start with your first products. <clears throat> so what you need to do is look at demand first. Is anyone buying this stuff? If not, it's going to be hard work to educate the market. I wouldn't go into that, as I said, in an early stage of business. Second thing is demand depth. It may be that $100,000 of stuff is being sold on page one, but if the top two listings are selling fifty dollars or $60,000 between them, it's going to be a tough market to take the rest of it. Um, that relates really to brand dominance as well, which is if one brand has like four or five listings on page one, they're very physically or visually present for your customers or your shoppers rather. And also, they are um, probably taking quite a bit of revenue. This is a slightly different question. It could be there's one brand taking a lot of revenue. It could be they have a lot of listings. Either is bad, but for slightly different reasons, if you see what I mean. And the third brand dominance thing is simply if it's a household name. Um, for example, I was looking at um, tennis rackets covers the other day in the UK, just as a sort of experiment with a mentoring client. And I'm, I'm okay saying this because we both decided it was a terrible market to go into. I wouldn't otherwise reveal, obviously, what somebody's actually considering selling. But we agreed that there was a, a brand called Wilson and Head. And even I, I'm very unsporty, had heard of Head uh, rackets and Head um, racket covers. So it was a terrible market to go into for that reason. Uh, the other thing is price. If things are being sold at a few pounds, then it's going to be a bit harder, a few dollars, going to be harder to make money. It can be done if you think you can source it very cheaply, but basically I would stay away from low price markets generally. Some markets have a big spread of pricing for all the way from say $10 to $80. If there's significant revenue being done at $80 or $10 or $50, that's a great sign. Um, if somebody's got a price, you could price anything you like on Amazon. I could put this iPhone cover up for $400, um, but it probably wouldn't sell anything. So it doesn't matter if somebody's got a product up with a price. What matters is a high price and revenue at that price. And then we want to start looking at reviews, but people over egg the review thing a lot of the time. I don't think the, the number of reviews a product had is necessarily that important. If the average review is like three stars or something, you could have a hundred reviews and people are still not going to be very keen to buy your product sometimes. You need to look at the numbers and relate them to each other. So that's a quick overview of that. The filtering process is a bit more complex than the idea generation process, which I think is why you shouldn't edit twice. You should edit once at the product idea filtering stage. So in other words, product idea creation, more and more and more and more stuff product idea filtering, less and less and less and less stuff. So you end up with a few things to take through to the sourcing stage. The sourcing stage, you've got to find suppliers, you've got to contact and manage them, you've got to manage 60 email conversations potentially. One caveat is I would suggest you don't contact that many suppliers in one go, or if you do, you just let most of them uh, wither on the vine, as it were, the, the conversations rather. Uh, you've got to negotiate, that's a fun game, there's a lot to be talked about there. I, I find it fun. If you don't, then you need to be taught by somebody who does. Once you know what you're doing, it can be a fun game, believe it or not. You've got quality control to deal with, freight and importing, um, using Air Express versus Air Freight. For example, when to use sea freight, when to use a customs broker, when to use a freight forwarder, 
um, when you're going to the USA and, and how important to US versus into the UK and the differences and some of the upsides and the downsides of both. And then in Amazon inbound shipping, how to get stuff from your house or from a prep center in the US probably into Amazon warehouses. And then finally, the next phase is the launch phase where you're going to um, writing a listing, how to write a good product listing, the keyword research and how to do that. That ties back in, by the way, with your uh, original market research. And I truly believe, as I said before, if I haven't, I need to reiterate, if you do great market research and you source a good product at a good price, the launch side shouldn't be a big problem. If you choose a terrible product idea and it's really saturated and or you've got a bad uh, supplier or bad product quality or the price you paid for it's too high, the launch will be quasi impossible. So really, I think you need to work very, very hard on the first two and the third phase, the launch phase, how to get it out there to people and get it selling. Whilst that's our focus as marketers and that's what we want to make it all about, really speaking, what the customer wants is, um, the, you know, first of all, what does the customer want? We need to provide it. And secondly, what they want when you're providing what they want for example, a stabilizing device for an angling rod so it doesn't flip around in our random example. Uh, as long as they are looking for that and you can provide them with a solution for that and not too many other people are, you're already starting off well. What they want then is a good product as in it physically does the job, it's well made and uh, it's at a decent price. That's it. So keep it simple in the you know, in the old Nexop computer here. Nevertheless, the launch, we've got to write well, we've got to do keyword research, you have to look into the benefits and why people buy this stuff and blend the two into copywriting, which is not a small skill. It is important and people will pay several hundred dollars. The going rate for a good listing for a significant product in America is about $500. I've just started offering that service. If that's something that interests you, I don't have a sales page for it or anything. So just email me, michael at amazingfba.com and just put a uh, product listing creation in this subject line and we can talk through whether we can do that for you. The other thing is photographs and images. You've got to have an image list. You've got to work with a photographer and make sure you understand the Amazon terms of service. For example, you've got to have a white background and understand where you can push it a bit and where it's risky as well. And that takes a bit of refinement. It helps to work with a coach on that briefly as well as a photographer. Of course, then the other two things are reviews and ranking. Reviews aren't as important as a lot of people make them in a lot of markets. Having said that, you've got to have some and they need to be strong. So getting reviews is a, a tricky old business, which I won't get into the detail here. But broadly speaking, email follow-up sequences are still very important and using launch services, the right ones can make a big difference as well. And then ranking, you've got to rank for keywords as sort of Various hacks, super URLs get used. I don't think they work anymore personally uh, for my data and that of my friends who know their stuff. I'm mean, talking about people who are selling hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. So they have enough data to be reliable. Super URLs don't really work. But there are some other hacks. You can use launch services and of course PPC. You can use Amazon ads as well. And then another area that isn't really talked about is reading the numbers. Finding and understanding the conversion rate of your products, very, very important to track that and to understand what it means and, and what it tells you should do or change or not change. And then the sessions as well, how many people are actually clicking on your products. And then you've got to understand the PPC numbers, the pay-per-click numbers uh, on Amazon ads, which can get quite ugly quite quickly. But if you're going to spend money, you need to understand that. And finally, there's sort of small stuff, customer service, dealing with negative reviews, which is a big thing, but not always possible to get perfect, but there are ways to deal with that. And then just checking for account health and making sure you're aware of what could cause an account suspension and making sure that you don't do that. So there's obviously a heck of a lot involved in selling on Amazon. Now, don't panic. You do not have to learn this overnight and you don't have to um, learn this on your own either. I think these things happen one stage at a time. I've just compressed probably nine months of your life into one little episode. But what I would say is to really succeed in something this complex, unless you have the, a certain kind of brain, you need some help. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I need help. People I know who are doing $250,000 a month, uh, you know, now um, when they started off, they did a course as well. So I think you really need three things to really succeed in this game. One is a course, and pretty much most people I know follow the course, not everybody, but most people. The second thing is a community and pretty much everyone I know who's successful is a part of some kind of mastermind. And the third thing is a coach. The semi-optional, the coach thing, I mean, it's more expensive, but it's the most intensive way to work that I can think of. And it's the sort of gold standard of teaching and learning. And I know from my years as a musician that 
uh, learning the piano in a group would have been way harder to get up to a high level in a, in a quick time. I say quick, it takes ages to learn the piano. The good news is you can learn these Amazon skills within a few months, but you do need to put some time and effort into it. And that's just normal. That's true for property management. It's true for, for stock market trading. It's true for Forex. I'm sure, um, not that I know much about that, but I've, had, I've dipped my toe to the water enough to know that you can't just dip your toe. And you need to commit to learning a model properly for several months. So if you feel that you need the help, um, I've already been running masterminds for a year and a half. And you can check that out at amazingfba.com forward slash mastermind. I've been running mentoring for two years now, which is one-to-one -one work with me. And if you want to check that out, go to amazingfba.com forward slash mentoring. However, if you feel specifically that the big roadblock for you is, is right now getting the market research done, so choosing a product or a product type or keywords, I should say more accurately, then you're in luck because I'm running training on that very subject. It's a one-day intensive training on Saturday, 21st of April, and that is going to be at um, uh, in Camden in central London. So if you want to check that out, go to amazingfba.com forward slash workshop and you can find out there all about it. It is £297, but it will include three months membership of the Mastermind plus 90 minutes mentoring with me. So you get all three things, the course, the coaching, and the community that you need to get these skills down and get making money. Thanks for listening.